But then where does the still life as you're painting the food sit? <laughs> is my brain trying to simulate the act of eating it, or is it, is it, is it drinking the painting? And that distinction could be key in a way. We know quite often the experiment was to do the study in the art gallery eating the food plated as the paintings on the wall, the still lifes are, to see whether. So, smell and flavour, which I think we, we kind of uh, talked about. What's interesting, I guess when you take ingredients like the ones we have up here from super sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and I was to ask you, cinnamon tastes of? Cinnamon? <laughs> Three? Coffee? Ginger. 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 But in fact, quite disappointed, Gilded Food Writers, we all know any stick of cinnamon if you buy things with is? Bitter! Vanilla, bitter, but it's the association that we have with those aromas that conjure up that impression of sweetness in some way. And that's interesting because, again, thinking beyond one thing that we didn't mention when we were talking about the kind of color and taste association, one very interesting part about that that I'd like to just kind of track a little bit and highlight is let's say red we see as being sweet, and we say the majority of people see red as being sweet. Again, kind of an associate, associative kind of uh, uh, connection that we have. Now, Professor Spence and the Elysia Foundation have done some research that I thought was absolutely fascinating, which is they put a red mousse, an identical red mousse on a white plate and a black plate, and they found that the people identified the white, the mousse on the white plate as being 12% sweeter. And that's, that's really interesting, and that's great maybe for me as a chef designing in a, a, a dining experience, but if we took ideas like that, and we thought about how we design children's foods, or we thought about how we design school meals, or we thought about how we incorporate some of these learnings. So I'm not saying that you could have a plain yogurt, color it red, and have children find the same satiety that they would from a sweetened yogurt, but maybe we could reduce the amount of sugar by 10% and reflect it in how we present it by enhancing some of the other kind of sensory elements of it. Now, uh, if you think, well, yeah, and what, what does that really equate to? Well, 10% of every yogurt, if we reduce the sugar, if you think if you could get every child eating, you know, a quarter to half a teaspoon less of sugar in a day, over a week, over a month, over a year, over a lifetime, surely that's got to be kind of moving in the right direction. And it's similar with this whole idea of how important smell is to our perception of flavor and taste. Surely there's opportunities within that. And I, I have a couple of slides down, I'll show you a product that has been kind of developed based on this idea that may kind of give us an understanding of how we can in some way kind of augment foods or tweak foods in a way uh, uh, to kind of bring out different elements of maybe saltiness or sweetness out of them uh, to enhance people's uh, kind of satiety and perception of uh, sweetness. When I first heard about this research that up to 80, maybe 90% of what we perceive as flavor comes from our sense of smell, um, this in really made me kind of think about how we design uh, our dining experiences. If 90% of what you experience as flavor is coming from your sense of smell, surely I've got to take that into consideration when I'm, when I'm presenting the dish to you or when I'm, when I'm creating this um, uh, dish in some way. So you've got the kind of traditional kind of posh idea that there we've got some salmon where we just simply smoke. Here we had a guinea fowl risotto that we had kind of smoked in a bag and in a kind of dramatic fashion, the uh, hostess would come along, rip, or, you know, with a, with a, with a, uh, a sash, well, no, not Stanley Knife, a kitchen here, don't use Stanley Knife, we use a, a surgical, what, 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 scalpel. Uh, scalpel. So you come along with a scalpel and, and you get this big plume of smoke. What does it do? What's the first thing you do when you see a big plume of smoke come out of your dish? <laughs> You take it in, you smell, and what that does is beyond just give flavor to the dish, what we found is this mindfully gets you to engage your sense of smell. Same like when I talked about the, 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 uh, the, the oyster ice cream, the bed of kind of dry ice or the blanket of dry ice that coats the table. What do people do? They, they engage their sense of smell, and through engaging their sense of smell, this encourages them to then be able to appreciate the full flavor of, of the food that they're experiencing. Here we have, so what we found was um, in the previous dishes here, this was very much smell used to enhance flavor in some way, or to, to kind of uh, make more salient certain flavors uh, in your mind. Here we, we were trying something different, which is I realized um, when you ask a lot of people, when, when you smell certain aromas out of context, we're not very good at identifying food aromas. We're, we're just not that, that, that good as human beings, although we eat a lot of food, I can give you 
Uh, should we try? Good. So, I'd like you to take some of these little seeds and just pass them along. And as you do so... Check, check out the answer. Ah, yes, it is, yeah. What I'd like you to do, put them in your uh, mouth, but don't swallow them straight away. What I'd like you to do is kind of grind, use our mouth as a pestle of water, kind of grind the seeds, release the essential oils, and gently exhale. will be looking for, if I ask you what they taste of, you'd say woody, nutty, like seeds. And yes, of course that's what they taste of. But what we're looking for is an aroma. So no, exhale through your nose. And let that retronasal, let that flow come through. So, if you think you know what it is, hang on to that thought for a moment. Most people that we give these to, some people get it immediately, and they can, they can, they can immediately get what it is. But if you do, hang on to it. Most people, I would say, I'd say about 10, 15 percent of people who come to the chef's table will immediately get it and say, "Oh, well, it must be this." I'd say about 55 percent of people uh, identify it, but it takes them quite a while. Do we have a sweet list, by the way? Are we getting a yeah. uh, good, good, good? Um, and then the majority, the, 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 sorry, the, 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 the rest. Uh, of the people can perceive something, but they're not really, they can't identify, they, they, they just don't have a clear. So they can say it's familiar. Yes, familiar. familiar. Not familiar. And it's edible rather than inedible. Make two fundamental distinctions. But what the thing is that's familiar and edible, do you know what we now chase? Effects. No, but um, close in some ways in terms of flavor compounds. No, but now, 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 that we, now that we're kind of shouting out, you did get it right, and they are strawberry seeds, exactly. And uh, once you know that, there's a, ah, of course, they're strawberry seeds, I should have known that. And what I found really interesting is when we have people at the chef's table, once they know it's strawberry seeds, it seems to get more intense. And all of a sudden, oh gosh, yeah, I can really feel it coming through now, and then all of a sudden, and that's because we've given context. But what you had there before was just aroma with none of your other senses being stimulated. So your brain needs more than just, even what you can say something like smell is so evocative. Oh, I can smell that, and if I smell strawberries, it would transport me back to, well, no, it doesn't. Because you need more than just the aroma of strawberry to, to give you context in some way. But what we found interesting was, if I was to spray um, if I was to spray chlorine, what does chlorine smell of? Truthful. If I was to spray uh, geosmin, uh, geosmin, well, I have to tell you what it is. Geosmin is the main aroma compound that you have in the, in the earth after it's rained, that kind of mossy smell. And these are smells that what we found is interesting is people can't identify strawberries without, uh, without some kind of visual cues, but as soon as you have more environmental smells, people are much better at kind of identifying those. And so with some of these dishes, as I said here, to give context to uh, the ice cream, the uh, ice cream, we, we, we served it with, um, uh, with, with uh, uh, the, the aroma of, of the sea. And these two dishes here, which are both um, call, well, both different kind of uh, evolutions of a dish. This is kind of not the day same one, this is now off the menu. But this is called Flavors of the Earth. And again, we had you know, the earth projected onto the table, the aromas. Uh, of the earth, and that, when I talked about kind of being emotionally engaging people, the number of people who sit at the table, and when they smell that geospin, when they get that smell of the kind of, uh, kind of moist kind of um, earth, it's very evocative of a whole range of different kind of uh, memories. And so, beyond just looking at how it kind of complements the dish, and whether it's just something that kind of adds to setting the tone, but it also has in some way stimulates a sense of engagement with a, a large number of the diners that we have. And just, sorry. Oh, by the way, that last one is on the, from the science side, I'm really curious about the smells, smells of the food, and the ambient smells, the environmental smells that are increasingly used in order to set a scene, to trigger a mood, emotion, nostalgia, all of those things, the smell of the sweet shop, the smell of the sea, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Uh, the smell of oak moss, that's not something that gets you salivating. So it's kind of an interesting thing going on here of, I want to introduce a scent by spray or by dry eyes, that sets the scene, but I want your, my diner's brains to segregate it from the food itself. Because that 
scene setting scent is not pleasurable in itself. I wouldn't like to eat that oak moss, but I want that to be there to trigger a mood or emotion so that when you get the food, that does taste good. Um, and then how psychologically or uh, in a culinary context, how do the chefs actually go about doing that, making sure that they, in the diners' mind they segregate stuff. And I sort of see that happening in a, in a, in a way that maybe the chefs will put the source of the aroma on the table somehow. So it's a higher sense that you put the hot water over in, 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 in a linear in Chicago. It is in the curly cube cutlery that has the, the, um, the herbs in the handle. You can see the source of the ambient scent. So it becomes natural. And maybe by localizing it in a thing at the table setting, then I can say that smells coming from over there. I'm eating this, and hence that can set the scene without being incorporated into what I experience of the food. And then, once we looked at it experimentally so much, yet yeah, I just think the chefs are intuitively in this space playing with things, realizing sometimes when they release an ambient scent, maybe it maybe puts people off. Or they, they have diners saying, I don't just eat that. Uh, and how do they intuitively? segregate sense and then how as a scientist can you come along and say brilliant could we now study that in the right sort of context to see some sort of principles or guidelines about about this i have i've experienced and done really badly this wasn't thankfully we hadn't done this a lot of our dinners but i went to a dinner where they sprayed they wanted to kind of recreate this idea of the smell of the sea the smell of the sea is incredibly difficult to replicate by the way it's not that easy because i, I went every you know even to like uh, sigma aldrich big chemicals company to try and get the compounds and you get the sulfide, which is the main aroma compound in the smell of the sea and it kind of smells like sewage I mean it's not you know it's so much more complex the smell of the sea the closest we've come to is using uh, I, well there's two ways really either using plankton plankton has that kind of great fresh the top notes let's say of the sea or by taking oyster shells and blending them and making almost like a stock out of those that, that tends to work quite well um, um, but I had someone once spray over us using an atomizer, a kind of seaweed concoction that they had made, and it was kind of like urine. <laughs> and, uh, you know that part of the kind of seaweed, that's why I think they over-stewed the seaweed. I think they did a bit too, you know, they cooked it for a bit too long, they didn't take the top notes, they killed the top notes and got straight for those you know, quite disgusting notes, and it just, oh, yeah, it didn't work. So yeah, I think there's always that kind of uh, um, balance with this. Um, and then these are interesting. So two commercial products have kind of taken the inspiration from this idea of aroma being so important, how we can see flavor molecule art, develop these kind of spoons that you can have little drops uh, and you put the little filters into this uh, section here. So you can have, let's say, a, a, a buffalo mozzarella, you can put a little basil uh, insert in there. And as you're eating your mozzarella, you get the whiff of uh, the aroma of basil and perhaps they mesh together in your mind to give you a, a perception of that kind of uh, basil flavor in there. Um, I said one of the two problems that there are with that so far is number one, the flavors that you have so far for this kind of thing smell very synthetic. And there's nothing delicious or appetizing about that. And um, I mean, we tried these. We, we bought a whole load of them. And to be honest with you, they didn't ever go on the menu. <laughs> and I better regret having bought so many. But um, I mean, maybe here there's a thing of, if I see that as the source of the smell, then I'm not eating. That alone through a synthetic and natural, mm -hmm. in a way that a, a, a bit of cutlery with a, a herb or, or, or a rosemary in it, I can see the source of the scent. And by seeing the source of the scent, I attribute it to a natural cause. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it seems less chemical to me. And both, both of these sort of fail in a way. Both it's commercially, it's too expensive to create the authentic, high quality scents. It's not worth paying for. Um, as well. <coughs> By the delivery method itself, yeah. it, it impregnates your mind with synthetic artificial. That cup on the right, if I know the plastic's been impregnated with the fragrance, do I want that? Is it going to smell good? No matter what it smells like, it's just not right. Uh, however, so, what, what, so well, again, I go back to schools and this idea we were talking about how can we create, you know, maybe in uh, particularly schools because we know we have the issue with kind of like one in ten children who go into primary school. Uh, that can sit classes obese and that number kind of doubles to one in five by the time they go to secondary school. 40, 40 million children around the world uh, consider being classed as kind of overweight or obese. And again, starting in schools, would it be interesting if, I, again, I don't think this is going to require, I don't think giving a child, I don't think giving my son uh, water in an orange scented cup is necessarily going to satiate these 
if he's looking for something that's uh, you know uh, kind of a sweetened drink of some type. Um, but I do think that you could reduce the amount of sugar that you put in, in certain uh, drinks by kind of in some way augmenting it with uh, supporting it with having that kind of orange aroma. I think if you had an orange drink in there that was maybe 10% or 15, 20% less kind of sugar in it, maybe having that aromatic stimulation, uh, kind of, uh, stimulation would in some way kind of balance it out and, and give them that kind of satiety. So although maybe these products aren't there now, but there is, there is surely there's kind of ways or interesting ideas in how, how these could be um, appropriate. <laughs> I agree. Yes. You can't say reducing it is better, it's just banning them. Really. I, but I don't think. Uh, okay, so this is. Uh, I don't think. Because if you take that kind of stance, the kind. So it's not really the children that make the choices in some ways, it's their parents that allow it. And, and the schools as well, and it shouldn't be yeah. for sale. I mean, our school has just taken out a vending machine from the school. Sure. Of course, the kids are going to go and buy sugary drinks. Yeah. If it's not available, they drink water and they're fine. And, 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 and I completely agree, but I think. Um, kind of sometimes taking that more hardline approach, even when you come to things like sugar taxes and stuff like that. Um, unfortunately, sugar Maybe it's taxes. Not realistic, but it's yeah, no, but I, and I do agree with you. Um, but even I think we did a presentation with Dave Sanchez a couple of years ago, and you know the idea of a sugar tax. Eventually, the people who pay the most. Uh, or who pay at the end of the day are the people who are the kind of least educated and least can afford to be paying that burden, and it doesn't really work to. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I have lots of ideas on this. that happy to discuss after. But, but yeah, uh, the other thing to do with water is just to put a slice of orange in it. Totally, it I, I agree. Yeah. And then it's fresh, and then you've got the vitamins from the orange. Totally. Uh, uh, this is doing that in a way, isn't it? It's got a hint of what it looks like, orange. It's all smells. Yeah, it doesn't like have any goodness, does it? There's no nutrients. No sugar either. No sugar, but no nutrients. So at least from the orange, I'm getting vitamins and C, perhaps. So. I agree. Yes, totally. And this is this is kind of one of the things that we were talking about, kind of school meals. What would it take to give kids water with a slice of uh, orange in it, or something like that? That would encourage them. More expensive, and someone would have to cut up the oranges. And I totally agree, but uh, maybe there are other it's things. A much more, it's a much more beautiful way to, to yeah. and I, and orange flavoured water. And I think to encourage kids to drink water at school is important because I don't think kids are drinking enough. I heard about something on, on the radio where someone was talking about how they put uh, soft drinks in a, in a, in a bottle. Oh, yeah, no, I'll talk to you. Yeah, because there's so many. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um, Texture and flavour. So, so uh, well, texture and flavour. We're going to touch on that, but really go into kind of texture and sound and how that kind of anyone who says texture isn't important in their food, I urge you to get them to blend their next Sunday roast and see how they like it. Um, and the only one point for anyone who's with us on this is in the West, every chef worth their salt talks about flavour and uh, uh, seasonality and flavour, and, and 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 that's great. But when you talk to uh, Eastern like chefs from the East. Texture becomes so much more important, and texture, it, it, we have ingredients like sea cucumber, like jellyfish, that actually they wash all the flavor out of it, uh, because like with ingredients like tofu that are slightly kind of misunderstood in, by a lot of, kind of Western consumers, it's not the flavor in the context or the way that we understand it that they appreciate these ingredients for, it's very much the texture uh, that, they, that they derive the satiety uh, from. But the West and the East have totally different affinity with texture. Sure, definitely. Because what we love in our in the texture in our food yeah. is absolutely that whole. And we're going to put a little bit of that to the test now. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, anything on texture before we move on? But also, it's mouth feel, you know, it's important. Maybe you have something in your mouth as a, as a, a mouth feel, it's part of the texture. Sure. With a big lump, and then it was something that's diced nicely, and you only mouth, and then you would blend the flavor. Mouth feel is the most important thing that you can have. Otherwise, you can reject something in it before it's time. Mm -hmm. So, oh God, it's present. You know. But you a big lump or something, it's really a thing. It's a great texture of the thing itself that's in your mouth. And the mouth feel is kind of how you feel. But that's correct. But the, the, the texture has to be. Be balanced, or you put it in your mouth in the sense that you can take the Asian food like it, and it's all been cut in such a nice way that when you eat it, it's a pleasant way of eating it. If you take somebody out of the spot and want a little bit of beef, beef eater, ah, like that, 
that's not even technically set down by the joke. But what I'm saying is a difference, big difference. And then the food related to that, it, to me, has also a mouthfeel because it's such a delicacy that you, it is very accommodating for you to really have an, an, an explosion of what really or really taste in your mouth, and then your brain gets it. Sure. So that, that's how I feel about food. Yeah. Uh, the textures under, the texture. under, undervalued. Here, for example, by the general consumer, they don't appreciate the rich range of textures or mouth feels as much as in some other parts of the world where they chew the flavour out of yeah. food in order just to deliver the texture, pure texture. Mm -hmm. um, and that texture, again, if you think you're feeling in your mouth between your teeth, turns out to be partly um, what you hear as well. Second work from the, from the New Zealand uh, sort of food science center, these are. They think it's cream and get people to rub their tongue. And that texture, again, you think you're feeling in your mouth between your teeth, it turns out to be partly um, what you hear as well. Second work from the, from the New Zealand uh, sort of food science center, these are, they think it's cream and get people to rub their tongue against their upper palate. And then you get a little bit of uh, cream to taste and then do the same thing, rub your tongue against your upper palate. And it sounds completely different. If you're paying attention to it, it's a part of that what we think of as now feel, from feeling in here is sort of driven by I guess, the sound of yeah, it makes sense. So um, on that note, you see that you have some headphones in front of you. Now, the dish that you have in front of you is called Royajin Servant. Royajin was an ancient Japanese god of the sea, but we're not interested in him in this instance. We're interested in the little creatures that were depicted as his servants in images, and they were jellyfish. So why would we serve you jellyfish? Well, there's the sustainability reasons. Uh, because we know that we've overfished the seas, we need to look for alternative sources of protein. Um, we know the jellyfish because we've taken, we've eaten a lot of their predators or caught them in bycatch, thrown them back in dead. We've, uh, the, the temperatures of the seas and oceans are rising, so they're blooming in numbers. And so one of the solutions, and they, they, they're quite an uh, invasive species, so they've done everything from uh, kind of invade a uh, salmon, raid a salmon farm and kill about 70% of the stock. They've, uh, they've, they've disrupted uh, or taken down a, a power station that was kind of based out in the sea, and they even uh, disrupted a US naval base. So, they may not be all that bad, but you never know. Um, the, the main point here is that when we first try jellyfish, you expect the texture to be pretty much something like if you take out the F, it becomes jelly-ish, and that's what we expected the texture to be like, but it wasn't. It had an almost kind of satiating bite to it, in the same way that you find with a kind of good seaweed uh, salad. And so we've created this dish called Rage and Seven, uh, which you have a taster of here now. What you have is the jellyfish that is, uh, we've marinated, so the jellyfish comes kind of devoid of any flavor. It really is collagen, uh, really doesn't have much flavor whatsoever. Um, and we've mixed this with, so what you have here is a nokodoko uh, cucumber, so a fermented cucumber which has been fermented in rice bran um, overnight. Um, so we ferment the cucumber and rice bran and then we, we blitz it into a gazpacho so without any other kind of seasoning in there what you're tasting is just the, the, uh, the, the um, lightly kind of fermented cucumber and we mix in um, the parts of the, the, the pulp of the cucumber with seaweed and uh, some other kind of seasonings and then we pour a little bit of the gazpacho onto it so I want you to try that but before you do we place our headphones on. Ah, so before you, uh, they will have switched off by now, so we just need to locate the on button, and if we could turn them on, because they will have timed out at this point. So just pull the on button down for a moment.
you have to try and work as hard as you can to say it's, it's all learnt. And the same thing about sound of food. Why is it that we like noisy foods? We weren't born that way. And it's the same sort of problem. Why would we, or certain people, like certain types of food? Well, because of what they signify, what they're correlated with in the world. And maybe noisy foods are fresher. If it's fresh produce, uh, and if it's a fresher vegetable or, or fruit, then it will retain more of its nutrients. Or if it's a cooked product, a baked product, a crisp, or a biscuit or breakfast cereals, then maybe, I'm guessing, as we are, the noisier the dry baked food product, the higher the fat content. And our brains like fat, but aren't very good at detecting it on the palate, and so we use that as a proxy. And we come to like noisy foods because of what they're associated with. Five stable illusions. This, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so all the, all the things you've had so far are kind of uh, things that are, have been are on the menu. Uh, the results of the uh, collaboration of this for me is kind of exciting. It's kind of the current issue. What? Um, and sorry, it illustrates the process of just uh, this is an image from psychology textbook, very famous for the last half century or so. Where I'm familiar with, where I teach my students of a. Um, an illusion or a gestalt perception. It looks like black and white spots. You it enough, and then you'll see what's in the picture. You'll see that there's a Dalmatian dog with its nose to the. Um, there, you go. Very nice. <laughs> there it is, highlighted. Dalmatian dog pointing with its nose to the ground in a park with leaves. So a moment ago it was just noise, it was just black and white spots, and then suddenly it switched into focus. This is a, uh, a paradigm shift, and suddenly you can see the dog. And what's interesting is, um, is there an analogy of that in flavour? That I'm experiencing, I'm tasting a wine, I'm not quite sure, I think maybe it's familiar, I know it's drinkable, but when did I experience it before? And suddenly it, it kind of locks hold, and you get that. You interpret the signal from the noise, and once you've done that, you can't go back. Once you've seen the dog in the uh, park here. If I were not to show you this image for half a century, when you saw it again, you'd immediately get it. Your brain has changed irrevocably in that moment. And it's sort of thing, is there an analogy with flavour? Or not? Maybe there isn't. Or maybe there is, but something to probe and test in that space. Um, so this is an example of kind of a gestalt grouping of visual perception and something that I've shown to Joseph in the pub uh, a year ago. And down here we have the other one that I said, surely if the dog, maybe that's not on the menu at the moment, but this, surely so this is something that the chef can work with. Um, so this is the duck rabbit illusion. Another classic from the psychology textbooks of vision, a bi-stable image. Looks like a duck, that's correct. And then back, and then forward. So it's bi-stable between two interpretations. I can see both, not at the same time, I can see one or the other, and it will flip back and forward, and I can measure it with the stopwatch my colleagues have. It's going to buy stable percept. Could that be translated to flavour? I'm going to taste one thing, I'm going to taste another, and then taste back. What happens if you can't see a tool? I can see a cork flying down as if they're going down. A cork? Yes, you're very careful. It's a cork, isn't it? It's a kind of a sort of a piece of a tree, and I can't see any cork. Okay, well, we'll talk with you later. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and this was kind of like a provocation or, or, or just think, here's the stuff in psychology that's so interesting that has never been put on a plate. How might that translate? What questions does it raise? And is there an equivalence in flavour of emergence of the dog from background or of bi stability? So we kind of took this idea, one of the things I really like about visual illusions, I don't know if the dog one where Professor Spence sent that to me, that took me, I mean, I didn't understand what that was meant to be. And it took me quite a while before I actually saw the Dalmatian. It was a couple of times of going back to the email to try and decipher what this image was with some kind of cryptic uh, subject in the email. Yeah. Um, but then this idea of what I like about it is it can be kind of very engaged. You're staring at this thing quite intently and studying it, trying to understand where the, the, the illusion is. So I thought, well, we, we're always, we want people to engage with our dishes and stare deeply and intensely into the dish and take in the beauty. Like, if you think of Japanese peiseki, Japanese peiseki, as you're eating it, one of the main things is, is that you stop before you eat each dish and you take in the beauty of what you're eating. And so we wanted a moment like that in the menu where people didn't engage with the dish in any other way than just looking into it. 
This course is called Every Act of Creation Begins with an Act of Destruction. And that was a quote by Pablo Picasso. And he meant it in terms of if you wanted to be truly creative, you had to destroy um, a, a kind of old ideas and build on a new plane. But I took that idea and I, or I took that kind of concept and I thought, well, that, that, that meant something different to me as a chef. And I thought, well, in kitchens there's plenty of destruction. Let's take this dish, for example. This has duck on it. Now, um, had I, if I waltz in a live duck into the dining room, there's not really going to be much of an appetite for that. We have to destroy the duck, take its life, in order to do something creative that our guests are going to find um, appetizing and satiating in some way. Um, so we, we explain this story to the guests, and then this, this dish is put down in front of them. And we ask them to stare intently at the dish, as I'm asking you to do now, and tell me if you can see a face staring back at you. And particularly, we're looking for uh, a half of uh, a man's face, uh, and it's specifically in this beetroot stencil here. We thought this was so easy that if people were just going to get it, and it was going to, it wasn't going to make sense. But actually, it turns out. Oh, very good. Yeah, very good. So who can see Picasso staring back at them? Good. Two. Of those ears that would maximally 
disoriented, so we have half the diner saying it's a duck, and half saying, no, of course it's a rabbit, because that would again generate conversation at table. Uh, and so this dish, while not being served, has been floating over the internet. We have a thousand people now paid six cents each to say duck or rabbit. <laughs> and then, if you like duck more than rabbit, does that bias what you see in the plate? And then, we haven't really yet, we're waiting for Easter. But well, this dish has been, this is an 18, 1890s visual illusion from Jess Ferrara, picked up by the philosophers. I know I've translated to food before, but Peter Brueger in, in, in um, Switzerland has done studies saying, if you show this dish at Easter time, people see the bunny. Show it in October, makes more likely to see the duck. So we're waiting to represent this dish at Easter time to see whether the, di the potential diner's perspective changes uh, as a result. So it's got a science on the plate, but then with a culinary challenge and a sustainability message, uh, and a bit of fun. Is it good to you? What do you see that generates conversation uh, at the uh, table? Yes. Yes. So we have 12, we have 12 versions of this shown on the internet for a thousand people. Uh, see, if you show this way, maybe it's where the ears go. So as, that, as the ears or beak go horizontal, it's more likely to be a beak. As they elevate the plate, it's more likely to be ears. And we do have that, we do have the data. Yes, yes. But this is not, uh, so this is something then. Uh, it doesn't look very strict, but, it, but how this dish is placed for the diner does become more important. Yeah. Yeah. Something that... Yes. Yeah. 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 So then once you've got from the kitchen, once you've got the angle right, then you can cut the stencil to map over exactly that, so when you're each and every time you... Yeah, but yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. Um, now I think we're uh, approaching the end of our evening, so we want to give you a little taste of Shivaz uh, to say it's cold night out there, isn't it? Now, uh, um, I, at Kitchen Theory, we've done quite a bit of work with Shivaz, looking at the kind of sensory properties of their of their drink. And I've been kind of all over the world doing kind of multi-sensory whiskey tastings, uh, and I'd like to give you an abbreviated kind of version of one of these now, just in a Kind of five minutes or so to kind of give you a, a hint or a, uh, an idea of what it is that we do. So when we know that when drinking wine, we know that a, a good wine can be made uh, better with a good glass. A Rydell glass kind of elevates most <coughs> wines, whereas a plastic glass kind of or a plastic cup is always going to take away from our appreciation of the wine. But what about the shape and texture and weight and feel of the glassware? Especially when it comes to drinking a fine whiskey, how does that kind of prevent our perception? If I could ask you now, using your dominant hand, uh, to pick up both glasses, each in turn, one at a time, and, and just based on the weight, the feel, the texture of the glass in your hand, if you were going to enjoy uh, a nice glass of whiskey, which would you, do you think you're going to prefer it out of? And once you've saved your glass, can we hold them up? Good, variety is the spice of life, it would be really boring if you'd all chosen the same glass. So the, the, the point is, two glasses we, you could say, well, you know, what difference does it make? But in our hand it makes a difference, that, that, that feel that we get from it. Now what I'd like you to do for the second exercise is we could pick up each one of them in turn, starting with the one that you, you feel you might like more, and I'd like us to nose them. We're not going to taste them yet, but just nose, mindfully nose each of these. Now, would we say that they smell the same? No. no. Now, there, there is no uh, fooling you or trying to trick you about this. As I said, we're, we're not into that kind of thing. These are exactly the same whiskey in both glasses. The intensity is much more. Definitely. I mean, the dram you expect. Indeed. The dram is most definitely going to kind of funnel those aromas, make them more intense on the nose. The wine rim glass will oxidize more, and therefore you'll get a different uh, perception of the smell. And if we go back to what Mr. Spencer was talking about, and this idea that 90% or well, up to uh, kind of 90% of what we perceive as flavor may come from our sense of smell, then surely the method of delivery of how we receive that aroma and the intensity of it is going to transform how we perceive the flavor. So I'd like us now to repeat this exercise of the nosing, but this time with tasting, mindfully tasting, and do take a sip of water uh, in between. Josh, Carlos, 
Can I use some water, please? Yes. Just to top up of some water. Um, take a nice mindful sip. I'm not sure, but it could be also the fact that uh, when, when, when you have a larger glass, the breathing of the object inside, whatever it may be, it loses particles of what it should be. Therefore, it is confined. Maybe, and it's nice that maybe this will get stronger, although leaving the same basis of the <laughs> Whiskey paint. Uh, yeah, but then again, I've also had the other argument, which is because that's why the rim of your nose can go into the glass, whereas it can't with that one as much. So that there's kind of, you know. Is it in the flow properties? 
Is it in the, in the capture of volatiles over liquids? Or is it in the psychology of, we all sort of know it's in the wine glass of influence in the well, I don't know. I mean, the kids, they don't yeah. We all know That's it. what I'm saying, is that yeah. they don't have preconceptions. Yeah, the kids, you're saying you, you, you do, although you don't. Whatever we believe, we all agree that the glass makes a difference, I think, it's an experience. And yet, when I look into the scientific literature, if it makes such a difference, why is no one studying it? And why are they only studying it in wine, not in coffee, in tea? And... You know, when you drink wine, you don't just drink wine, you have the aroma as well, that that's part of the two things together. Uh, unfortunately, in this case here, I felt the first whiskey that you get on the glass has lost part of the strength, alcoholic strength, or something, the aroma is thrown away, it has not retained, but this one is very much more stronger, and I should tell you my nose closed, and so I can tell you, but the, the, the glass, this one also, we are used to drink the beautiful glass, and you can't see the difference, and it's not the same. I don't know, but Joseph, I think you'll be happy with that, to say that your attention is drawn to that aspect. For good or for bad. Some things that we think about the world of wine, but we don't think about so much in other cases. And we can argue about the cause of our perception changes in some ways. Where it changes, I think I feel like it's I experience it differently, but I know it's the same. As you sort of said, it's an interesting too. But it would say in the restaurant sometimes in the guild of food. Don't tell it's the same. It's not the same as it's not all this, but this is this is the rest of the course we found people that are going to be perfect. It's the same one thing, you put the air with it. Yeah, actually, you can't get stuff to be the source of doctors in the legal system and face profit. They would be much more than that. You can accept brandy, it's different classes, it's different. It's not actually the same. I've got a specific thing, I think, so I really understand it. Obviously, the way everything is presented for the serve, especially Part of that is maybe it tastes better in it, and part of it is it looks cool, it's part of the branding and so on. Um, but generally what I've found is a lot of the glasses they tend to go for tend to be kind of open rim, or tend to be wider rim. Um, and smooth, actually. Chivas don't tend to go in for the kind of etch crystal style of tumbler, they tend to go for a much more kind of rounded shape. Right, it's fascinating. We are supposed to be out by nine. This is all because of Right, so, yes, last uh, but not least, so, I think general consensus, yes, we know they're the same whiskey intellectually, but no, they don't taste the same out of a different receptacle. Uh, now, to kind of uh, look at kind of texture, uh, so we looked at the texture of the glass, but what intrigued me was this idea, when we were doing a concept called synesthesia, and synesthesia being kind of a neurological phenomenon that occurs in about 4% of the world's population, when you hear people like artists who say, ah, oh, when I hear music, I see colours, that's a form of synesthesia, it's basically where your, uh, your senses are kind of cross wide in the brain. One interesting case was a gentleman called Michael Watson, who, when he would eat foods, uh, he, would, he would feel them in his hand. He would feel the textures of different foods in his hand. And they didn't necessarily have to correlate with the shape of the food or the texture of the food. So he would taste roast chicken, and the chicken wasn't roast enough to it felt pointy. And he, it was a tactile sensation that he, he genuinely kind of felt in his hand, or at least claimed to, and they, they studied him for years and years. Um, but then we, we again, kind of Use this with this idea of if anyone's had a kind of FT Marinetti, uh, he wrote the Futurist Cookbook in the 1930s. He was a futurist, and he believed that when you invited diners for dinner, that you should ask them to come wearing pajamas with different swatches of material, so that throughout the course of the dining experience, they could reach out, rub on each other's gym jams, and get all sorts of kind of flavour and textural stimulation in the mouth. So we took this idea. Uh, yeah, no. uh, so we took this idea and did see this idea of kind of uber kiki. So, you know, this idea that maybe 
rubbing the wine, if I have velvet in my hand as I drink whiskey, that they may bring out the kind of smoother, creamier, rounder, sweeter notes. Whereas if I have the kind of rough side of Velcro, that may make more salient in my mind the kind of more astringent or alcoholic kind of notes and tones. And um, we, we try this with every, every dining experience that we do. And I would say roughly 100% of people understand the concept. Velvet linking with sweetness and richness and creaminess, rough textures relating to the more astringent kind of uh, idea. And I would say about 40% of people actually genuinely feel, as they're drinking the whiskey and rubbing the, the velvet, that they really do get a change in perception of how they, how they perceive it uh, as a flavor. So, I, uh, what you have, uh, the chef has also put down on the table, are these little goat cheese balls. So this beautiful cheese from, uh, it's golden cross goat cheese from Sussex. It's beautiful. We've coated this in a kind of light clove biscuit coating and then dusted it with some icing sugar. It works beautifully. So you don't think of goat cheese with, you, with whiskey, but it does work beautifully. So, um, kind of on that note, I'm going to leave you to fondle your cubes and enjoy the remainder of your whiskey with your goat cheese. I think on behalf of Professor Spence and I, thank you so much for your being here. I've got a few code and hope you followed that. That that was um mind expanding and, and possibly part of the expanding in tiny but we were writing about and really um there's a lot more to it. Um, I would just like to let you know that you can absolutely blow your palate with a discount. Well. Um, if you, I mean, obviously, you'll all be intrigued by the dictionary experience that you can describe. Um, for obvious reasons, it's not the world's cheapest experience, uh, and I'm sure it's worth it for me. But the great thing is that everyone here tonight is up for a 20% discount. There isn't a special code.